Akash, you're up on the screen, so whenever you're ready. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that kind, kind intro. Oh my goodness. <laughs> thank you so much. So I couldn't fly in, unfortunately, at the last minute because I am a sick boy. So after this, I'm just gonna like collapse in a heap and play Spider-Man for the rest of the day. Um, so if I, if I go into a coughing fit, sorry. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is how every single one of us as game developers needs failure and iteration to do literally anything. And this doesn't even go just for game development. This is literally all of life in general. And we need to fail and try again and again and again and again and again for absolutely anything decent to happen in our lives. But unfortunately, when we look at other game developers, or anyone else that we look up to, really, we always assume that it's perfect and comes easily. And I'm gonna be talking all about that throughout this whole thing, but also that trap comes up when we start hiring other people as well. So when we start bringing other people onto our team, we somehow, for some reason, assume that they won't need any time to do the thing. Like, oh, what if we just, we need an artist. What if two weeks, even though I've been working on this game for nine years, like, what, mm, that's, mm. Probably not a smart idea, every studio ever, but hey, whatever. So I'm going to be talking about that sort of stuff as well and how we absolutely need it regardless. But for those of you who have worked on a game or started a game or finished a game, show of hands, how many of you have started a game and finished it and it went perfectly from start to finish without any issues, no bugs, no surprises whatsoever? Anyone who raises their hand is a liar. None of you are raising your hands. Good. Excellent. Honest crowd. But for some reason, we assume that that's only the case with us and nobody else, which is a complete falsehood. When I started working on Hyperlight Drifter, we thought it would take a year. It took three. <laughs> so that's, you know, a tripling of the amount of time. So now whenever I get hired for any sort of game or anything, and they say like, oh, it's going to take a year. I'm like, okay, it's going to take seven years. Let's just put that in the price already. Um, but even when I worked on games like Destiny, they're like, oh, we only need like two or three tracks. Like 12, 14 tracks? So that's that's how this goes. We tend to underscope things and we don't tend to know how far things will go and how long it takes. But when we worked on Hyperlight for three years straight, we all failed a ton. There's so many features in there that absolutely didn't make it in. Some that were like in the Kickstarter video that we had to cut. Some things that uh just we thought were going to be really cool that didn't work out at all like we had a stamina system in that game dark souls-esque and it totally sucked so we had to cut it and take it out and at the at the end of the game i made a total of about a thousand maybe even 1500 sounds and 300 to 400 made it in and that's normal that's completely normal that's part of this process yet for some reason we get married to our darlings and think that that's it's supposed to go smoothly and easily but the unfortunate truth is, is that when we start working on a game or any project, it doesn't even have to be a game, anything that's important to us, we think things like passion and motivation are the things that are going to push us through all those hard times. It isn't at all. We're co told constantly, nonstop, like, find your passion and everything will work out. You'll never work a day in your life. Mm, I hate that so much. It's not even remotely true. Every single one of us have dealt with the issue where we start working on anything, anything that's important to us, and then our motivation goes away. And the most passionate people I know are the ones who are struggling the most. Because as soon as our things get tough, as soon as one little crack shows in the armor, our passion disappears, our motivation disappears. And for some reason, we're not told that that's normal. Like, Passion and motivation are two of the most fickle emotions and states that we can be in. We get fired up at the start of a project. I still do. That's normal. That's human. Every time I start a new project, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be easy. I'm going to make this the best thing ever. And we feel motivated like there's a big blaring Star Wars symphony playing in our heads telling us that we're going down the righteous path and that this is all good ideas and everything will be perfect. And before we know it, everything feels like garbage and everything sucks, and our work feels all of a sudden really boring. So maybe the first year of school, everything feels great and fun, and then by year three, you're like, I hate this. And I'm sure a lot of you have felt that before. That's normal, but literally no one talks about that. They say like, hey, be passionate. All right, peace, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do my thing. But the people who are willing to actually go through that, those feelings of boredom or just feeling like trash 
or knowing that, okay, this is worth it no matter what, and if working in a sustainable way, those are the ones I see succeed the most in any industry, from game industry to fitness to athletes to doctors or anything in between. Those are the ones who get through it. The people who take the little baby steps, who push 1% further every day in a sustainable, healthy way without burning themselves out, that makes the hugest difference. That's the biggest thing I've seen that, de uh, that delineates people who make it in the game industry and people who don't. And there are two kind of mental, maybe even physical currencies that we need to think about when it comes to working in a field as tough as games. It's a fun field. It's super fun. I love it. And the people in it are the best, which is why I'll never leave it. But we never start, we never think about our health. We never think about the sustainability of the work we do. And unfortunately, the culture of a lot of studios isn't about sustainability. It's about crunching 24 seven. But optimizing your energy and your focus, those two currencies, energy and focus, are two of the most superhuman things you can do to separate yourself from everybody else in the industry and actually make it and make a great living doing it. So energy, let's talk about like, optimizing that first because it is something that no one really talks about very much, especially in tech fields where like being super unhealthy is kind of a badge of honor. Like, oh, I worked until 4 a.m. last night. Like, it, that means your life is out of control. That's mm -hmm. Anyone who comes to me and it's like, oh, I want to work for you. Like, do you have any openings? I'm like, I do, yeah. I hire other sound people all the time to work with me. What's your, what's your like, are you willing to work overtime? It's a trick question. People are like, oh yeah, I'm willing to work. I'm like, all right, you're out. Nope, you're absolutely not allowed to work, done. Because it's, it's not sustainable. And when you are staying healthy and taking care of yourself as much as possible, you can get way more done in less time. And I'm going to give you the keys to optimum health because I've read a book a week on high performance nutrition and healthy habits every week since I was 16. I'm 30 now. Every single week. I've never stopped. Now, when I talk to PhD nutritionists, we're like level. It's super fun. Like, oh, let's talk about nicotinamide diriboside. Even though I'm sick, I knew exactly what I needed to do to up my energy for this next hour before I go back to sleep so I can at least serve you and deliver this well. It's crazy important. But if you sleep, eat well, exercise, and spend time with good humans, there, you know everything. Wow, amazing, but no one does it. If you do that, if you do at least one of those, sleep, eat well, exercise, and spend time with humans, good humans, 1% more, you'll be so far ahead of literally everybody else in any comp competitive field like games or art, or any sort of artistic field, it won't eat like you'll be so far ahead that there won't even be any competition. And a lot of your energy is determined by those things. And we all, when people say like eat well, I know there's a million like diets and stuff like that out there. We all know what eating well is. We all know that we all know what junk food is. Even when they surveyed a whole bunch of five-year-olds across the United States, they said, what's junk food and what's real food? Every five-year-old knew. We all know. We all know. But still at like 3 a.m., we're like, oh, yeah, I'm working hard. Let's eat 70 Oreos. Mm, we all know. We all know that that's bad, objectively a bad idea. And unfortunately, I see so many people who are a little older than me in the industry who are amazing. They do work incredibly well. They're focused. They do all this stuff. But then when they hit 40, they're like, oh, I'm so sick all the time. Like, I wonder if it's because you eat Taco Bell every... No, that can't be it. You're just old. No, dummy, just don't eat Taco Bell every day. Jesus. I know there are health conditions that, of course, that come just out of chance and that you can be born with. But there's a lot that are that's in our control that a lot of people don't bother with. The bar is so low in the game industry that if you just do a 1% improvement, people are like, well, you're, you're amazing. Wow so much work done. I can't believe you ate a salad three weeks ago. Whoa. But unfortunately, that's the truth, but that actually is easier for most of us. But a lot of our energy on top of eating well, sleeping, exercising, however you want to do that, is related to the people we spend our time with. And this is really important, especially for those of you who are in school, this is really good, or have recently graduated, or have a friend, friend circle. This is really important. And a lot of you have probably heard the quote, you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. So that's from Jim Rohn and a whole bunch of other people say it. But it's definitely true. And we have to, even though it can be kind of cutthroat sometimes, we sometimes have to choose better people to surround ourselves with. I like the quote of love your family, choose your friends. 
So you can choose the people that you surround yourself with. And you don't have to make sure that, like, okay, everyone I hang out with has to be a millionaire. Like, no, don't do that. That's a little stupid. But just pe choose people who aren't complainers, who don't hate their lives and are constantly complaining. We've all seen those people. You don't have to surround yourself with them because you start to adopt those mindsets the more you are around those people. And the more you're around positive, driven, successful, however you want to put it, whatever you think is healthy for you people, the better off you'll be and the better off they'll be because you'll all feed off of each other. And all the studies that are done, they look at people who are, you know, substantially unhealthy and they're hanging around people who are healthy. They start to take charge of their health. People who are like chronically, 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 chronically sleep deprived, hang out with people who sleep well, they'll start to work their sleep better. People who work healthily and sustainably and people who don't really hang out, people will go up and start being like the people who are working for sustainably. It makes a huge, huge difference to your life overall. And this is something that I spend a lot of time on. I don't necessarily like sit down with a journal like, who am I going to cut out today? I'm not a Bond villain, but it's something that you do need to be cognizant of. There will be people who it come and go throughout your lives who won't serve your, your path in some way, shape, or form. And I'm not saying if someone's having a hard time, you cut them out. No, 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 no. But it does mean that if someone is chronically, constantly complaining about things that are well within control of their lives or just they're just actively trying to undermine you, mm, that's not something that's worth being around if you want to get to a next level. And the thing is, as you start improving yourself, you'll start to see little signs. You'll start to see little bits and pieces of people saying like, oh, that must be, that must be nice. Or... Oh, I could never do that. Or why are you working out all of a sudden? You look totally fine. Like that's like parent thing that I hear a lot from my, my parents when I go to the gym all the time. Or like if someone asks like, oh, what have you been up to? Like, oh, I'm working on this new game or whatever cool new project you're doing. And they're like, oh, I could never do that because terrible reason. Like nobody, nobody asked you. I didn't, I didn't, I don't see why you can't do it. I don't care. You asked me. I don't, oh, uh, oh. Uh. So there's a lot of flashback that will come up when you start to improve yourself. And that's something that you need to keep in mind. You will, if from people all, all around you, but the people who are supportive and positive and driven and all that sort of stuff will be like, hell yeah, get it. That doesn't mean you won't get criticism. You might actually get really constructive criticism. Some people might be like, you know, that's a, not a good idea. Maybe you shouldn't make a dubstep polka soundtrack for this like deep ennui Dark Souls essay. Maybe that's a bad idea. You'll get criticism. That's good. That can be really healthy and good. It doesn't mean that good people are always going to support you no matter what, but it does mean you want to be around the sorts of people who will be willing to call you on bad stuff to support the good stuff. That's really, really, really important. I can talk about resources and stuff on how to do that later. But as we start to develop more in any sort of artistic field, game development, or really anything, like I said before, that's important to us we start to think of this little thing called talent. I have none, personally, and that's learned recently a blessing. Talent is something that does exist. Like, there are the four-year-old pianists who can play Mozart without even, like, by hearing it once. Those people exist, 100%. But one, most, what most people don't know is there have been countless studies, countless studies that look at hyper-talented people and hyper-focused people. Like, say they're separate groups. Sometimes you'll get a mix of both, but that's very rare. And talented people quit before anybody else in any field. It can be game development. It can be artistic. It can be uh, athletic. When you look at Olympic, Olympic athletes, vast majority aren't. Talented. They just work really, 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 really hard. Because everything comes so easy to the hyper-talented that at the first sign of pressure, they give up. Like, I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, which is, like, known as the Hogwarts of music schools. It is, it is well known. I'm House Slytherin all the way. Hardcore Slytherin. Prefect Slytherin House. But when, when I went to Berkeley, I saw 12-year-olds who could play better than any professor there. I saw people who were my who could just destroy me. I was a drummer. That was my primary instrument. Who could just destroy me. And they'd played for, they don't even practice. They don't even try. But after year one, after the first year of Berkeley specifically, the 60% dropout rate, and the majority of those 60% are the talented people, almost always. And I remember seeing all these 12-year-olds, all these 20-year-olds, all these, like, whatever age, who were so good, who were so good. 
cry when they got a B on a test because they weren't used to failure. They weren't used to any sort of pressure whatsoever. So that means really good things for us mere mortals because it means we're going to be told no for the rest of our lives constantly, nonstop, whether it's getting funding for a game or it's working on a team or trying to hire someone or anything. We're going to be told nonstop no. But if we're to actually deal with that pressure, if that's something that we can actually put up with constantly, wherever, in a healthy way, that means we're going to be fine. We can actually deal with those stressors. We can deal with those issues. We know that it's part of the process. In a recent study that was done is looked at Super Bowl athletes. So I'm not a huge football fan, but athletics is just interesting because a talent is something that they talk about a lot. And they, apparently when they are looking at football players in college to recruit them for the NFL, they rate them from one to five stars. Now, one star isn't bad. You're actually still pretty good if you're one star. And five star means you're godlike. It means you're absolutely incredible. So when they looked at the starting lineup for people who are in the Super Bowl, none of them are five star. None of them are rated five star. Because, again, people who are super talented, the ones who are seen as the golden people, they got a little pressure. Someone said no. They screwed up just a few times. They quit. They completely quit because they can't take that pressure. So this is good. That means there's so much more room for us. Hooray. But if you're willing to like take that, and the thing I uh, tell people is when they're starting out in the game industry is like, oh, I'm brand new. I've never, I have zero experience. I've never worked on anything before, but I want to break in. And most of you have more experience than zero. You've gone to school or just been working on your own, whatever it may be. Uh, you want to think about, can I take this for 10 years? Absolutely everybody ignoring at least up to, up to 10 years. It might be shorter, might be longer. But for most people, when they ask, oh, I want to break into the industry, I'm like, cool. Do you have 10 years of being ignored and feeling like trash? Eh? Sound good? That's how it actually comes about. And I'm not saying 10 years of AAA amazing experience. Just 10 years in general of you just working. So if you went to school for four years, that's four years out of the 10. Gone. Done. We passed that. So it takes a really long time to make any sort of headway in a field that's meaningful to you. That's why it's hard-ish, hard -ish, depending on your field and all that sort of stuff, to break in and work on really, really cool projects. But that doesn't mean it's going to be like nothing, 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 nothing up to year nine and a half and then something suddenly happens. No, that's, that's not how it works. There will be a gradual process and you'll grow throughout that. That's something I want to keep you to keep in your mind is that you do need to think about it ultra, ultra, ultra long terms. And unfortunately, I get a lot of emails of people saying like, okay, I've never worked before. I need to succeed tomorrow. Like, well, I'm just going to put you in my email filter that's called toilet people. And I do actually have a filter in my email called toilet people. And there's no escape. Once you're in the people folder, you're there forever. It's a delight. But when you start thinking of that, we need to realize that talent isn't what's going to push us through. It's our skills. And skills really come about habits and what's known as systems which is just a fancy word for habits and i like the quote that a guy named james clear if you should look him up james clear um showed uh, said that you don't rise to the level of your goals you fall to the level of your systems so when people start thinking of goals goals are great you should absolutely write them down do all that stuff because that's useful and it'll give you a bigger trajectory for your life that's fantastic but if you have no habits or systems to actually do those things, to actually work on the thing every single day or every single weekday, whatever it may be, then you're not going to get very far. What happens to a lot of people is that they start working. They're like, oh, yeah, this rules. They start putting in 18-hour days, and then two weeks later, they quit. Where someone who has good systems and good habits will say, oh, I want to work on a team like this, or I want to work at this company, or I want to start my own company, whatever it may be. Okay, cool. What's your system to do that, make progress on that, even if it's two minutes a day, every single day and if you do that that even if things get stressful even if a life event happens even if things go down the pooper whatever it is you will start to be able to continue to work on whatever it is you're doing so if you have a good system for eating healthy even if you're in an airport and trapped and are surrounded by terrible food you'll still be able to find something healthy if you are working on a project that is feeling kind of drawn out or that your passion kind of disappeared. You have good habits, so you're going to be able to keep working on that. Now, this ga the game industry is more accessible than it's ever been before, which is awesome. That's wonderful. But it's also harder to get a great paying job in it because of the saturation of people. So if you're able to do have great habits, if you're able to create great systems, 
while keeping yourself healthy in a sustainable fashion. Again, the bar is super low, so I'm not saying you need to be like an Olympic athlete. You literally just need to like go outside and sleep okay, because again, the non-existent bar, you'll go a lot further over the long term than a lot of other people. But unfortunately, there's a lot of cultural pressure that shows that we as the game industry don't really know how to do this. Companies certainly don't. They have no idea how to manage people for the most part to be able to make it sustainable and work well. And individuals are even worse. So like freelancers like myself tend to be even worse at that. They're like, all right, I'm going to work till 4 a.m. That's the standard thing. And then wake up at 6 and do it again. And then two weeks later, they're just not able to work anymore. They burn themselves out. It's up to you to find out what systems, what habits, what do you want to build? What works for you? A lot of people take off, bite off way too much. They'll say like, okay, I'm going to learn Unity and I'm going to learn Unreal and I'm going to be the best artist ever and I'm going to do sound design. Okay, I'm going to do six hours of each every day. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The pursuit of less will actually get you a lot more throughout your life than, the, than thinking that being more means doing more. So if you can just do a little bit every single day, the bar is so that you'll actually go so much further than everybody else around you. Well, not everyone in the room, because you're all going to take my advice and you're all going to kill it, and that's going to make me real happy. But to summarize everything, and we'll do some questions and answers too, of course, you always have to iterate. Everything will take a ton of failure. Even if you are working for an employer and they say things like, oh, you know what? Do it again. Or like, that, that isn't good. Or whatever it may be, that's normal. Except that that's part of the process. That's completely part of it. It took me until two years before I got the sound of hyperlector kind of close of just trying stuff over and over and over and over and over again. And that's true of most of the people on that team. It just took a long time to actually get it and to get everything to click. So if you want to have a really solid life in the game industry that pays you well, that you're healthy, you're able to do things like hang out with friends and have time for yourself and have hobbies, that sort of stuff, a really good life, have to deal with constant failure and constantly being told no. There are way easier fields to go into. You can like become someone who enters data in an Excel spreadsheet for the next 60 years. That's probably really enticing to some of you. That's just, there's like one of you in the room who's like, yeah, I love Excel. But for the rest of you, that's something that if you want to be in the game industry, you have to realize that because it's a fun field, because it's saturated, because a lot of people want to break into it, you have to deal with failure and hearing no all the time if you want to make a difference and have something beyond just a standard job or just something that pays okay and that you're constantly struggling and working crunch 24-7. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you'll quit. And if you quit, that's actually okay. I'm not saying quitting is bad. If you realize, like, you know what, this isn't for me, and you bounce, awesome. That means you saved years figuring things out and you might find something that's a better fit for you. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. But your talent, mm, doesn't really matter. Passion, mm, super doesn't. I absolutely against that idea. Motivation will have absolutely nothing to do with this sort of success that you'll have. Those three things, talent, passion, motivation, they might ignite a little spark. They might get you started. That's okay. That's great. You might play a game and be like, oh, that's awesome. I want to make something like this. Cool. That's fantastic. For example, when Miyazaki, the creator of Dark Souls, was inspired to make he was just in a clerical cubicle, just a normal job, nothing to do with game development. And someone, one of his friends said, hey, you should play Eco. He played Eco, was super inspired, and then busted his ass to work on Demon Souls and then Dark Souls. And now he's the president of that entire company. Now, when you interview him, when there are interviews now, uh, after, after Bloodborne was released and he was going to work back on Dark Souls 3, I'm paraphrasing, I don't know the exact quote, but he said something like, it was with great regret I finished working on Bloodborne and it is with great regret I returned to working on Dark Souls 3. Awesome. That is more accurate than passion. Absolutely. I was like, yes, you're the most realistic game developer I've ever seen because you're willing to acknowledge that this is going to suck. Yeah, awesome. I was like, That's the most realistic quote I've heard about this i'm not saying it's going to be sad all the time but he knew what he was in for he knew that even though he got that spark from eco it's going to be tough it's going to be tough to make more games but it's worth it in the end for him so your health habits systems social groups the people you hang out with 
all that sort of stuff is going to set a foundation that will actually allow you to push through and get better and better projects. If your energy is good, you'll be able to work better and get more done in less time. If, if your social groups are good, you'll actually be able to push through the tough times, which will come up 100%. If your habits are good, that means you won't be able to, you won't be, you won't succumb to temptations or you won't quit or you won't think that, oh, all of a sudden, oh, my passion has failed. I must need to find something else to do. There's no game development gene. There's no passion that's built into us for a certain thing. That doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We talk about finding our passion like it's built into us and that we need to discover it. It's like something James Bond will create. Like, okay, I'm going to put a passion into everyone, but they don't know what it is. That's, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. No, passion comes through after you've done the hard work and then you get good at it and then you start doing it. It comes after Passion follows, you don't follow passion. So that has a lot to do with how you will actually make it in a field like this. And it's a tough field. I'm not here to give you a downer talk, but it is a tough field to actually get into and actually start working in. So these foundational things make a huge difference. So thanks so much. We'll take questions and all that sort of stuff. I assume I'm on Skype, so I have no idea if that's going to work. But yes. Oh, I made it through that coffee. Oh, lordy lord. The case of the vapors. Uh, someone will need to repeat the question to me. I think I heard most of it, but if someone could repeat it. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, so there's a few ways to think about this when it comes to being inundated with a ton of tasks. So I'll give you a few suggestions. Some will work, some won't. It's totally personal. So just take what works and throw away what doesn't. So a few things that you can do is you can cycle. So what cycling is, is that throughout the day, let's say you have two projects or three, let's say you have three projects. You'll work like 20 minutes on one, 20 minutes on the other, and 20 minutes on the third, and then take a break. You'll break it up into those chunks and keep cycling like that. That may work, that may not. It depends on the person 100%. A few other things that you can do when it comes to managing a whole bunch of projects, which I also have, so I can speak from experience, is that what you need to do is that in between each one of your tasks, let's say you work really well on this thing and you're going to work on this other thing, but you don't feel so good about it, you have to do something that's known as in like the performance world or like psychological sports performance world is known as a clean cut. And a clean cut is, let's say you've been working on your computer for two hours and you've been working on this project, it's been going great. Then what you need to do is take a break. And what most people do is make the mistake where when they take a break, they say, oh, okay, I'm going to go to YouTube or I'm going to do something else. I'm going to check email, whatever it may be. When we're working on a computer or doing something similar, and then we switch to doing going into break mode and using the computer still or doing a similar task, our brain genuinely has no idea that work has stopped. It's still draining energy, even if you're watching YouTube or doing something that you think is completely separate. So for example, you might think that like, oh, well, during a break, like an athlete walk around. No, their body has no idea that walking is separate from their gymnastics performance. It has no idea. So what you need to do is something completely separate. Our brain it actually works like a car battery. It works by being used properly. So it gets recharged by being used, not by actually doing nothing. That I'm sure a lot of us have been on the Netflix couch for seven hours and not felt any better by the end of those seven hours. It's because our brain sucks. We need to actually use it to actually heal it. So one thing I recommend is when you take your breaks in between tasks, completely separate yourselves. No screens, absolutely none, zero. 
because then your brain will actually know like, oh, okay, I need to do something else. I'm going to recharge. I'm going to recharge this part of my brain. So it can be taking a walk. I have a dog, so I just lie down on the floor and let him run all over me, which is the best. Um, so, or it can be, it can be um, doing something by hand, like writing in a journal or something like that. That is a complete separation, absolutely complete. Or you can do a chore, like doing the dishes or something like that. And that will actually recharge your brain to actually be able to work a little bit better. Now, depending on where you're at, if you're working on multiple things, it may be, it may be, and I don't know your situation completely, obviously, but it may be that you need to do less. Could be, I don't know. It could be. Um, it could be you need to do less throughout a day, or throughout a week, or something like that. Or it could mean that you need to batch things where, let's say, three projects, you'll do one on Monday, one on Tuesday, and one on Wednesday. That may not work depending on your schedule and when things are due. It really depends. That's that's a tricky one to, to implement. Um, but one thing I'll recommend you do, no matter what, and this is, goes for all of you, is when you do need to take a break, or even if it's like five minutes, like you're just working on a project, it's going well, but you need just a little refresher, 60% of the fatigue we feel when we're at a computer is visual. It's visual fatigue, but we feel our whole body feels tired as a result. Notice that our, our inclination when we, when we need a break is to like kind of close our eyes a little bit or we want to go to sleep or take a nap or close our eyes. This is, our, this, is this part of our brain, the visual part of our brain telling us, oh, my eyes are real tired. Please, please stop. So even if closing your eyes for five minutes is all you can do, that will help recharge your brain a little bit because most of the fatigue we start to feel, especially early on in the day, that like 2 p.m. slump that usually happens is visual because obviously we're not using our bodies a ton while working on games, probably, unless you're in VR, um, but you probably aren't going to be using that a ton. So just little things like that are going to make a big difference. There's also all sorts of stuff I can say. If you want to email me, I can send you like, here's like 70 books that you should read. I'll go through them. A report back, um, but I can tell. But those are some general tips. You also might want to look into things like, I this is like so, but you can also go into things like getting your blood work done. Like I go to the doctor just to hang out and chat because I'm a crazy person. I'm like, oh no, I already know how to read my blood work. I don't need a doctor for this. I'm just here to talk about like see react proteins for an hour. Let's, let's hang out. Let's chat. You don't have to go that crazy, but you may want to look into health and nutrition things as well because that can enhance energy and focus and all that sort of stuff. But again, I can provide resources. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but that and I should say that. So don't sue me. <laughs> yeah. I hope that answers your question. Can someone repeat that? Oh, what a good question. Yes. Okay. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. Ready? Even the most successful people you look up to have no idea what they're doing. And they know it. And they feel it. That imposter syndrome will never go away. Ever. <laughs> Ever. There was a great interview where the roundtable uh, Hollywood interview with uh, amazing composers. They had Hans Zimmer, they had Danny Elfman, so composer of Fable and The Simpsons and Nightmare Before Christmas and Lion King and Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails and John Powell of How to Train Your Dragon. All these amazing people at the top of their field. And at one point, Trent Reznor, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails pops up and says like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And every single person around that table said, oh, thank God, me neither. This is, these are the people who've worked on Nightmare Before Christmas. Like Danny Elfman said, oh, oh, I'm so grateful to hear that because I thought I was the only one who didn't know what I was doing. I don't know if you've listened to Nightmare Before Christmas. It's pretty okay. Uh, <laughs> or anything that Danny Elfman's done, or even Hans Zimmer or anything like that. It, it can, it, it will ebb and flow. That imposter syndrome will absolutely ebb and flow. Some days you'll be like, ah, I feel great. That'll be, that'll happen but combating against it will only make it worse. Every time you try and fight an emotion, we've all felt this, like, oh, I'm feeling sad. What if I fought it and made myself hurt? Everything gets worse? We've all felt that. When we fight an emotion, it gets worse. So the thing I'll recommend is instead of combating it, is allow yourself to be like, you know what? I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. You can, I, one thing I'd recommend is reaching out to someone and say, just like if you have a close friend that you talk to about this stuff, reach out and say like, oh man, today just, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like a failure, blah, 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 blah. 
And the response that you'll get is like, yeah, me too. <laughs> and most likely is what the response you'll get. That's good. You want to express that as often as possible. It can be out loud on your own too. If you don't have someone to text, that's okay. But even just even just saying out loud, like, man, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing today. I just feel kind of, man. Eh. That will actually set in motion a bunch of th uh, thought processes in your brain of like, okay, don't, but what can I do to actually start improving that mind state? So one thing I'll recommend to all of you is when those things come up, feel them. I'm like, don't just ignore them and push them down and putting them in a box and close it. That makes things worse. But also start, start asking yourself what questions instead of why questions. Why questions are fine. Like, oh, why do I feel this? That's okay. That's fine. What questions can actually lead to more actionable results? So like, oh, what can I do to make it so that this imposter, like I can, I can show that this imposter syndrome isn't necessarily true. Or like, what have I done lately that I'm really proud of? What questions will actually set your brain into motion that will help you start thinking of things like, oh yeah, I, I still feel like an imposter, but I've done some cool things. So I'm just going to keep working for a little bit longer. That's okay. That's be gentle on yourself when it comes to that sort of stuff because I feel it too every day, every single day. Every time I step on a stage, or even when I did like a TED talk, I did two TED talks. When I stood up, stood up on stage, I was like, oh, well, oh, oh, that's normal. That's completely part of this process. I guarantee every single one of you in this room has thought, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I guarantee all your heroes before, until they die, will be like, I don't know, man. Uh, so it's okay. It's part of it. It's something to accept instead of like, I hope, I know that's not a totally satisfactory answer, but I hope that, that helps in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if this works. Oh, yeah. Testing? Oh, that's loud. Yay. All right. Um, do you have any advice about balancing trying to get a product done by a certain deadline with working on it when you think you feel that you're up to it and that you think that you're going to make good progress on it, if that makes any sense. Give me, give me an example. Um, hmm. Let's say you work a few hours in the day and you get home and uh, you say to yourself, oh, I should be working on this because I'm trying to get this done by a certain time. But you don't feel like you're really up to it and that you'll make good progress. Um, and you try it, and then it's just a sludge through a giant swamp of mud and sadness. Uh, so, have any advice about that? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, it died. Oh, God, I'll chop you. One sec. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, there. It's all about, okay, great. So, uh, the thing I'll recommend is when, because that's normal. One, that's completely normal. Like, you work, and then you come home, you're like, ah, oh, jeez, I don't want to do this thing, or like, it's going to suck if I open this or whatever it is. The thing, the, the concept that I think would be. Really is known as mini habits. So mini habits is like a really cool concept that I really love. Um, and you can look it up. There's a book on it, but you don't even need the book. Mini habits are basically making things that are important to you so ludicrously easy and so stupidly simple that you can't not do them and you feel silly for even thinking that that's an amount of work. So for example, let's say you come home from work and you have a project that's important to you that you want to do. Let's say it's in Unity. You open up Unity. You're done for the day. You win. That's it. You close it and you walk away. And it's how everyone like starts laughing and like, oh, no, that can't work. No, it works. There's so much science that absolutely proves that that works. But what you do is the things that are important to you, but the things you don't feel like doing, you do a laughably small amount of and then call it good. And the, what, here's what's going to happen. Let's say you open up Unity and then you hit Command Q or Alt F4 and you're good. You're done for the day. Your brain's going to be like, I can, no, I can, I can do, do a little more. Don't allow it. You're doing the opposite of what most people are doing. So what you'll do is just say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. No, even though I know I can, I'm not going to. And here's the thing. Your brain is now going to be, no, 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 please, please let me do it. And before you know it, you're going to be in unity working on that thing because you've stopped yourself from doing it. Because every time we stop our bodies or brains from doing something, what happens? We want to do that thing a lot more. When we tell ourselves you can't have that Oreo, you're then like knee deep in a pile of Oreos covered in crumbs wondering where it all went wrong. <laughs> 
So what you have to do is do that with the things that are important to you. You have to do that and say like, okay, I'm going to open up Unity. I'm good for the day. I'm absolutely not allowed to do any more. And if you don't want to do any more, that's actually okay. Leave it for the day. Absolutely leave it and call it good. And then what you do is do that a little bit every day. Even if it, or if, even if it's an athletic thing, do one push up and say like, that's my workout. I'm good. And your body's going to be like, I can, no, I can do more. You're like, absolutely not. That's not allowed. And that will actually slowly start building a habit and a loop, because all habits are loops, that will actually train you to be able to work on that thing that's important to you. Because you know what? It's like an Oreo to your brain now. You're not allowed to do it. And that's actually going to get better and better habits over time. It makes a big difference. I know it sounds stupid. I know it sounds stupid. But a lot of people have a lot of success. And every, even Olympic athletes use this regularly. They'll like, do one bicep curl. I'm good. No, I'm good. And then their body's like, oh, you could, please, please let me eat these Oreos. So think about it in that way for things that are important to you. Because the more important something is to us, the more resistance we feel. That's a common thing. If something is important to us, the less likely we are to do it. Because human brains are the, the worst. I hate them. But when you start thinking about this and flipping it on its head and doing a, a mental model known as inversion, that can help you start building those habits slowly but surely. But take it slow. Literally open Unity or whatever it is. Quit. You're good for that week. Do it every single day for a week. Then do five minutes. Then seven minutes. Then eight minutes. Very gradually. And then before you know it, you'll be up to, you'll be able to work for long periods of time on this thing. And everyone else who started working 18 hours a hour days quit years ago. So this is how you build this over the long term. You seem to have a deep connection with the Oreos. <laughs> I love Oreos. <laughs> love them. Thank you so They're much. So good. <laughs> You're welcome. I don't know if any of you have had Swedish fish Oreos, but they're the most disgusting thing on the planet. Don't even try. <laughs> oh my god, they're vile. Oh. <laughs> um, hello. Oh. Um, so we're trying to get where you are in accomplishments and things of the similar. Ah. And the unhealthy lifestyle isn't so much as glorified, but it's it happens because we're trying to cram in the specs and the samples and the games because we feel like we're running out of time and there totally. is just so much, you know, we want to get to that high place before it's too late. Right. So do you suggest we slow down? Because there is, it's when you're taking on games and unpaid internships and jobs to pay for the intern, in, I mean, unpaid internships, it's not really that we want to be eating chips at 12 in the morning, but we really don't have a choice. Or right. so we feel like we don't have a choice because we want to get to, you know, Bungie or, you know, Activision or where we're trying to go or the similar. So what, what should we do? Should we slow down? Ah, uh, okay. Here's a, this is great. I'm so glad you asked this. So there's a few, there's a few things in there. There's a lot of folds that we can dive into. So one thing that I'd recommend is not you can uh, you can do a few things so there will be a lot of tasks that are thrown your way and actually the, the more i guess the word i'll use is successful but i'm sure there are other words i could use that are better or the more experience the more experience you get the more things will come your way internships working at companies moving to a different city projects all that sort of stuff you'll get more things thrown at you or you'll at least see more of those things that you can at least try for so here's <laughs> One general thing that I'll, I'll tell you as like a broad thing, and then I'll dive into some specifics. But one thing I'll recommend, and this, this helped me a lot during Berkeley, is this Bruce Lee quote, which is, it is not the daily increase, but daily decrease. Hack away at the unessential. The closer to the source, the less wastage there is. So Bruce Lee is pretty well known as the greatest martial artist to ever live. I don't, yeah, I don't know. He's okay. Uh, so he's pretty damn successful, and there's someone telling you to do less. But here's the thing you'll find as you talk to people who are doing pretty well in an industry who are healthy. There's a lot of people who are doing well who are horribly unhealthy. But the people who you probably want to look up to, uh, they'll say things like, oh, no, I cut things off. Like, I don't do the unessential things. I've started saying no to a lot of things. And that has helped them a lot. So one thing I'll recommend is a general thing is you don't have to slow down. 
but, but I do recommend doing less things and shotgunning out into a thousand different directions because that'll actually ham hamper you. So let's say you want to work at somewhere like Activision as an artist. Hy hypothetically, let's say you want to work there. What you need to do is get, obviously, get really good at art. Network. Oh. <laughs> We're good. So those things you want to know, okay, let's say it's Activision. You have your site set on Activision. Talk to them, ask them what they're looking for, focus on those things. There will be other things that come up, like unpaid internships. Maybe that's something you want to do, hypothetically. Let's say it's not. Or you'll have like, oh, uh, can you do art for my podcast thing? Can you do art for this YouTube thing that I'm doing? And it's kind of related to games, but not really, and it's not really on your path. This will be great practice for you to start saying no to those things. And here's the trickiest part. You'll get better and better opportunities that you'll constantly have to start saying no to. I was recently invited to go do sound design for the BBC in, in London. I was like, and I had to say no because it's unessential to where I want to go. And even when I was in college, even when I was in college and I was starting out and everyone's like, oh, okay, I'm going to go perform for Disney and then I'm going to audition for Broadway and, blah, 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 and they shotgun themselves out and now they're working at the Apple store because they're so tired and burnt out that they can't do anything. Like the brain burnout is a real physiological symptom. Your your synapses in your brain actually stop firing as efficiently. It's a real thing, and you want to avoid that as hard as much as you possibly can. You're in this for the long haul, absolutely. So think about long term stuff. So if you if you're thinking to yourself, okay, this is a cool opportunity, will it help me in the long term? And 99% the answer is going to be no. You want if you let's say you want to do the artist at Activision, focus on the things that they're looking for and hack away at the unessential so that you can get really good at those things. Networks, get good at art, learn their pipeline maybe, sleep, that's really important. Because when you show up to those interviews, when you show up to those uh, networking events or talking to those people and you've put in the time to the things that these people are looking for, you'll be so much better off than someone who has 7,000 things on their resume that you barely even touched. That makes such a huge difference. So you'll learn learn what's important to whoever it is that you want to work for, or even if you want to start your own company, learn what's important to your company, and then focus on those. Cut everything else out and sleep good. Sleep real good because it's going to make a huge difference. I'm I'm not kidding. I do interviews at AAA companies for fun. I never want to work at a AAA company, but I get interviews just so I can network with everyone at the company on their time. <laughs> It's a, it's a secret networking trick. I'm like, oh, I want to meet the CEO of Naughty Dog. I'll just get an interview. So I do that sort of stuff just so that I can network. But every time I, I talk to the people who are at the top, like I'm just talking to The Last of Us 2 creative director or the Sucker Punch creative director, every single one of them is like, man, the thing I focus on most is family and sleep and going home as early as I can and making sure that I keep myself sustained so that I can see this project. That's what all of these top people say. It's just an unfortunate truth that the people who are starting out or younger or things like that think we're told that the idea is that we need to burn ourselves out, but nothing can be further from the truth. I really recommend focusing on just a few important things. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna be so hard to say no to those good opportunities. But I recommend if something comes up this week for any of you, practice saying no if it's not essential. Absolutely do it. And I trouble for saying this but even during Berkeley if an assignment was unnecessary I'm like oh learn this jazz thing on drums I'm like I already know I want to do video games so no I'm just not going to do it uh, but it's fine and I put the time into something else I put that time into getting good at audio and networking I put that time into things that I knew were important and I knew what was important by talking to people in the industry that was a really long answer but I hope that helps yes it does thank you yeah Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, Akash. I'm going to hand it over to Henry here. Uh, if you want to go to my website, akashthecar.com, and email me, like, feel free. Just let me know that you're at the Pixel Fest thing, and I'm like, super happy to help in whatever way I can. Yeah.